where we go to fighting secret so i realize it's the weekend and i owe you a combatives video but i haven't been training in two weeks why because i have like a nasty rash that um i got from grappling it happens if you grapple a lot you get rashes sometimes and i've got to let it heal so i don't get staff right um so but i was at the shooting range today with my bro and i had him th film like 30 seconds seconds 37 seconds of me shooting and I figured this would be a great opportunity to go over some combative pistol shooting with you guys. We're going to break down some uh, mistakes that I made. And then also I'll explain to you some of the methodology behind what I do, why I do what I do when I'm uh, at a flat range, an indoor range. You can only do so much tactical stuff in the indoor range before you get yelled at by the RO. But this is going to be a really great opportunity to talk about combat pistol shooting especially when it comes to training yourself to be more of a combat shooter on an indoor range. Now, I know a lot of you guys around the world in the UK and stuff don't get to shoot a lot, but this will be definitely very handy for you if and when you do get yourself on a live fire range. Now, you can also do this stuff with air guns, dry fire, all of that stuff as well, um, but just do realize that at some point you need to put lead down range. The way that I shoot really harkens back to the Fairburn Applegate methodology. I'm a big proponent and a big believer in um, the point and shoot method developed by those guys. If you'll see, I do have a tendency to really lean forward and that's directly from the Applegate Fairburn system. I later on was able to train counterterrorism in Israel uh, and their system, the Israeli point and shoot method, like literally is from the Fairburn Applegate method. So it's fairly unbroken lineage the way that I train combat pistol shooting uh, going back all the way to Fairburn. So enjoy. I really encourage you guys, whatever your sport is, whether it's shooting, whether it's jujitsu, whether it's boxing, film yourself. I always try to film myself whenever possible. That way I can do something like this, go back, look, this was a mistake I made. I could do this better. Oh, I'm doing this well. I'll do more of this, that type of thing. All of the high level MMA athletes that I know personally, um, and I know a bunch of the UFC guys that go to my gym and train, they all film themselves whenever they can, and this is how you get better. So with that being said, guys, let's jump into it. Let's look at combat pistol shooting methodology, the way I like to train it on a flat range, and we'll break down some really good stuff for you guys. Stick with us. All right, so the first mistake I want you to look at is this. See that little snap down there? Let's pause it. So for those of you guys who do not know, this is called recoil anticipation. It is the number one thing that I see that messes shooters up. And generally they will hit the target a little bit low. What it is, is psychologically you're anticipating correcting the recoil that you're going to feel when the round fires. So you will push your wrist into the gun, causing it to shoot low. It's a psychological thing. It affects everybody. Generally, what they say is dry fire is the way to correct this. What I like to do is put either a snap cap or an empty shell casing into my magazine. I put a couple of them here and there, and I mix up my mag so I don't know which one is which. And that way, when I get the click and no bang, I see am I anticipating that recoil causing my shot to move and miss the target. Now, in this case, I'm using about a three inch target about 21 feet away. That's enough to notice if you don't hit the target. Obviously, when it comes to combat shooting, as long as you hit the individual in the chest or the center or the vital areas, you know, okay, good enough, right? But when I, again, when I was training in Israel, something they were so, so, so hell bent on was extreme accuracy under duress, under pressure, they said every shot that was outside of the target could potentially kill a civilian. And if you've ever been over there, obviously in places like Jerusalem, in the markets, the souks, whatever, where the streets are like incredibly narrow and tightly packed, that's definitely a concern. As a concealed carry holder here in the States, that's also a concern for me. So I do like to train extreme accuracy under somewhat of a duress and pressure. 
and make myself hit that small target at about 21 to 23 feet away. I find that that really helps my accuracy the closer in that I get. So that's what that was and that's why I do that is I intentionally load a dummy round in there so I can tell if I'm snapping that pistol down psychologically anticipating the recoil. And it helps me to remember, hey, slow and steady, slow is smooth, smooth is fast. And if you'll notice my grip, my right hand is extremely tight, gripping the pistol almost to a point of shaking. My left hand is a lot looser. I find that for myself and frankly, most shooters that I have taught, that's the optimal grip to maintain relevant accuracy. And if you'll notice there, I got that click and no bang. My immediate reaction was tap rack, move laterally. You're always gonna wanna move laterally, especially when you are exposed like that, just standing there shooting. You don't wanna just stay stationary. It's the same thing as boxing. You throw a jab, cross, you move. You throw a jab, jab, you move. You throw another jab, you move. So it's the same principle here. This is something they harped on at Tactical Response quite a lot. And it really carries over into my training now is always, if you take an immediate action, move afterwards. Doesn't matter if you're moving through cover, if you're just taking a step laterally, if that's all you got, that's all you got, but you gotta move. As you guys can tell, I'm all about loading up that empty brass every couple of rounds and forcing yourself to take those immediate action drills. Also, something I like to do is level change. When I am reloading, if I'm not moving laterally, if I don't have cover to get behind, maybe I get down on one knee. That's something they were big on in the Israeli point and shoot methodology. Fairburn was big on that as well. Or I should say Sykes, but fighting is fighting, whether you're fighting with a handgun, fighting unarmed, fighting with a knife, it's all about movement. Movement is life. As you guys can tell, I did a little chamber check at the end there. That's, again, the Israelis really ingrained that into me. James Yeager told me he thought it was stupid, but I always do that before I holster just to make sure I'm not having a malfunction, that I'm actually dry. And I do holster at the end, not only because I'm on a range, but if I'm actually dry, I'm completely out of rounds, I'm at least going to retain my weapon. If I do need to pull it out and whack somewhere over the head, well, <laughs> that's an option, I guess, but I want to make sure that I do retain that weapon and the holster is where it belongs, is where it lives, right? All right, guys, hopefully you enjoyed uh, some of that. Some of that was helpful to you, I sincerely hope. And we will be back next weekend, Lord willing, with some actual hand-to-hand -hand combat training for all of you loyal viewers out there. Much appreciated. If there's anything that you'd like to comment on, uh, please be nice about it, but put it down there in the comments below. And I'll catch you, Mother Flowers, next time on Gutter Fighting Secrets. We'll see you on Wednesday. We're going to do my philosophy chat. And then, again, like I said, on the weekends, hopefully I'm healed up enough to actually get back to it, start teaching again, and then I'll film a couple of things for you guys as well. It's still next time. Until next time, stay safe out there, sheepdogs. Cheers, Mother Flowers. <laughs>